In previous videos, we have refloored framed ceilings and walls, jacked the floor, fitted door jams, lined gap filled and painted walls and ceilings of our filled in veranda remodeling project. In this video, we restore 100 year old reclaimed doors, but find they're full of borer and dry rot. So, what do we do? We had some difficulty finding doors to match the originals from this house. Uh, this one here is, is, is ideal, it's got the four panels. Um, the only thing it needs is that hole filling in because we won't be using like your normal latch, we'll be using the traditional rim lock with a brass knob on it like we have in the rest of the place. Um, so that will go in here nicely, but over here Leading into the, the bathroom, uh, we've got another door that's slightly wider, um, but it needs a bit more work. This is the only other door we can find. It's got this hardware on it. It's got knobs on it. We'll replace that anyway. Take all this off. But the biggest problem with the door is top of it's only 45 millimeters. Somebody has cut that off for some reason. Fortunately the bottom is 210. So what we plan on doing is taking a bit of that off, attaching it to the top. We want the cut on the bottom of the door to be as straight and clean as possible. To achieve this, we use a cutting guide that we measure from the bottom of the door and the panels. This will guide a saw along that cut, nice and straight and clean. Surprisingly enough, that does a very neat cut. But the timber is a bit... Yeah... Bit ordinary in the ends there, isn't it? And of course, the top of the door is not even. Yeah, so we're going to have to trim the top as well. We're using the same technique for cutting the top as we did for the bottom. Because then when the pieces are joined, there'll be no gaps. Although with the top, we're cutting off as little as we possibly can. Yeah, it's nice and straight now. We could just glue that straight on, but probably best to dowel that. At least three dowels in there. So it'll be a bit stronger. Right, now what we've got here is a, just a dowel gauge. I'm going to get that around about in the middle so we can loosen that up. Adjust the hole so that's in the middle. What this does is that there's a hole there we, we, we can drill into it so it sets the height on the timber consistently throughout. And when we pop the dowel in, we know it'll be. Uh, right this way but we still have to measure it from this end here so if you make it to mark this as accurately as possible we use a builder's pencil sharpened like a blade and then use a square to mark a line around the corner so there's no confusion as to where the mark is Can't see squat. We need light. Oh, we can see that now. We then drill holes in the top of the door using the drilling guide 
to the marks that we've just made and corresponding holes in the piece that we want to join onto the top of the door. All right, we can just pop a bit of glue on the end of these dowels and whack them in. Persuade them in gently. We then repeat this process with all the dowels, then check they align with the holes in the top of the door, then glue both surfaces so there will be plenty of glue in all the gaps. Then we slide that in. Gently slide it. Even though the holes were smidging out, it actually makes them nice and tight. Which we actually need here because I don't have a clamp long enough for that. We thought we'd chisel out what appeared to be a little bit of rot from the bottom of the door, but as we chiseled, we found that the center appeared to have hollow bits. So there was in fact some sort of termite or boar infestation. So the whole piece wasn't any good at all. All right, I've decided uh, that piece of wood is too far gone. I need to um, put that in the waste pile, wipe that excess glue off with a damp cloth. It's been a nice smooth surface there. And we're going to have to cut another piece of wood and put on there. That's the the wedge of the door there which when you belt that in that expands and holds the whole door together so that's actually compromising the strength of the frame so if we put a another piece on there the wedge can still work right what I have here is uh, just a piece of pine framing um, you know, it seems to be nice and flat, so we could just glue that on. Um, but we're going to have to um, dowel it in a slightly different, slightly different height, because that's got a radius edge. It's actually 45 wide, that's 38. So if we dowel it on about there, we could then plane it down to match the door. And fill up all these little knot holes and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's going to be painted, so it doesn't really matter too much. Right, I've just um, doweled this piece of framing timber on there. It in also trimmed a little bit more off there so that the wedge in the end of the door is firm up against this timber. <coughs> so if we need to tighten the corners up, we can. It's not compromising the strength of the door. Any other of those? Ugh, there's more termite holes in there, but we can just fill those up. That'll be right. It's a little bit crooked, but once that's all dry, we'll just plane it all. In the meantime, we want to fill in these holes. We'll be using Builder's Bog because once mixed, it goes off within an hour or so and it's as hard as wood. To fill in this large hole that was for a door handle, we don't really want to fill it in with bog because the stuff is expensive. So what we can do is cut out some polystyrene foam and fill in a majority of the hole and then the bog will just go on the last 5mm or so of the surface. We can do the same with areas of the door that have been eaten away by borer. Right, the quickest way to get this bogged up surface flat is with a belt sander. Okay. 
see a belt sander takes all the, the tops off and so it gets it down to a nice flat surface and it does it quite quickly you can see that some taking that down there's still some little divots in there but it won't take much bog and just one more coat and then that will get that nice and smooth you can run it along this edge too right then we <clears throat> run some bog over those parts that still aren't flush make it a little proud so the next time you hit that with the belt sander it will be nice and flat well that's the theory anyway once we've finished bogging everything we then must belt sand the whole door to get the surface nice and flat right we've got um, most of this door filled in we found quite a few more um, of the borer cavities close to the surface. The timber's really, really thin and you tap it and you go right through it. And like there's another one there, there's one there. And you're probably wondering why I'm bothering with this door if it's so full of borer. Well, they're hard to get, the doors. I'm trying to find one that's the original style from a 130 year old house. It's not that easy, so when you find one, you think, yeah, bore holes, yeah, bit of bog, no worries. Right, where the bogs run right to the edge here, of course, we've got this detail here, and it's filling in this gap, so what we need to do is um, chisel that out, but trying to do it by eye oh, is not all that easy, so just run a pencil line along there. And we'll just put our chisel on that edge just to cut that piece off. On doing this, we find another bore hole that needs filling. The bog doesn't stick to the molding very well because it's shiny paint and has dust on it. Then run the chisel along the natural line that's in there. We've got to mix up a little bit more bog. These ones right on the edge, we just squeeze that bog in as hard as we can and we purposely overlap the edge so that we can cut it back later, although we don't want too much excess on there. That's just a waste of bog. And we found another one over here sounded hollow so just give it a bit of a tap of the chisel and it went through and see the whole inside of the door has got borer channels in it because they can't just pop up in the middle of nowhere to so probably come in from the bottom have their little channels up inside and then get near the surface in places which is what's happened here as long as the door's all solid there's nothing wrong with that I'm just filling all in bloody holes it's really hard to do that in one go eh? so no, I'm gonna to have to come back for a second run there we've also planed down bogged and sanded that piece of framing timber we added to the top earlier the scraper is then used hard into the corners to remove any excess paint in there and on the flat surfaces we haven't sanded yet to remove any loose paint and little blobs of dust and gunk that has been left in there by previous painters. In the process of doing this, we discovered some dry rot in one corner and our friends the borer have reappeared. You can see like pink, yellow, like turquoise and then a brown. So it's been four layers of paint. On the floor. Once this is all finished, we need to hang the doors. But before we do this, we need to fit some new hinges. The hinges we're using are larger than the original ones, so we need to do some chiseling. The hinges need to be checked into the door, so the gap between the door and the jam is as small as possible. 
we're just making the original cutout for the hinges larger to fit the new ones. We then screw the hinges to the door first, which is pretty hard to see through my fat head. We then check to see how the door fits. Once the hinges are checked into the jams, it looks like the door will fit nicely. So we'll go ahead and do this. We hang the door before the final sanding and painting because we can access both sides. To find the position of the hinges on the jams, we firstly put packers on the floor, then sit the door on these packers, and then mark the hinges on the jams at the correct height. We then mark square lines in and start chiseling. It's important the hinge is positioned, so when the door is closed, there is only a small gap between the door and the stop. A spare hinge is then used to mark the edge where we need to chisel in a groove for the round part of the hinge to fit into. Once again, we then test fit the door to make sure the gap around it is about four to five millimeters. Yeah. Then with the door in the open position, we can put one screw in the top hinge holding the door by hand. With the bottom hinge fitted to its cutout, we put one screw in so we can try the door out. Beautiful. We then check it from the other side to see what the gap is between the door and the stop. Yeah. We then fit the rest of the screws. We've hung this door too. Although the gap at the top here is a little large and the door itself has a little twist in it so the gap at the bottom there is a little bit wider than I prefer but yeah, it's a lot of work to do anything about that and it'll be fine. Right, we can then get into the final sanding of the door. We'll use this orbital because it gets right into the edges easily and if there's any variations that because it's got a sponge base on it the, the sander actually gets into hollows it doesn't give you as flat a surface as a um, belt sander but we're not worried about that at this point Orbital sander can be used on an angle to uh, sand these mouldings on the uh, edges of these panels, which is quite handy. To sand the curved bits, we just adjust the angle of the sander as we go. And the parts we can't get to with the sander, we do by hand. The important thing when using a sander is not to go at it too hard, otherwise you may cause more damage to the door that needs to be filled in. See a bit of a texture here. Not sure where that come from, obviously previous paint not really been done right but uh, I'm going to leave that in there because it actually adds a bit of character to the door which is what using an old door like this rather than a brand new one that's what it's all about. Sanding leaves a lot of dust on the surface that must be removed before painting because paint doesn't stick very well to dust and even if it did the finish wouldn't be as good. We firstly apply an oil-based primer undercoat. This is mostly necessary for areas where there's bare timber, but where there's old paint it also helps the top coat stick better. Oil-based paint is the best for doors because it dries harder and the door won't stick to the jam. It also allows for a much higher gloss finish, which looks nicer on this style of door. 
The primer undercoat makes it easier to spot parts of the door that still need filling. And in the case of this door, that ended up being quite a bit, which then needs to be re-sanded. Then there's areas such as the corners of the mouldings that need to be reshaped with a chisel, then sanded by hand, exposing timber, which then needs to be reprimed and undercoated. This process is repeated a few times until finally you end up with doors that are ready for a final coat. But before the final coat goes on, all traces of dust must be removed to get a nice clean finish. Applying the final coat of paint is the most rewarding part of restoring old doors because finally you're seeing the end result from all the work that you've put into them. This brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, we'll be trimming our unique ceiling, which seemed impossible to begin with because of the angles, but we got it in the end.